listening to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey, and I'm uh, here in Grays Lake, Illinois today at uh, Reformed Forum Studio. And I'm delighted to be back with you with some some friends uh, and an exciting topic. It's a big, big day. been looking forward to this for really a couple months, and uh, particularly several weeks since I got the book. But before we announce that, let me introduce to you, we have Jim Cassidy who is the pastor of South Austin OPC down in South Austin, Texas. Welcome back, Jim. It's good to see you today. It's good to be here, Camden. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's good to talk to you. It's been a few episodes since we've had you on, Mm -hmm. so glad to have you back. Yep. We also have with us, uh, I believe for the second time now, but certainly we've we've known uh, about our brother for a long time through his scholarship, but we're welcoming back to the program Dr. James Eglinton, who is the Meldrum Senior Lecturer in Reformed Theology at the Univer- University of Edinburgh, and he's the author of a very important uh, new book. But welcome back to the program, James. It's so good to have you with us today. Thanks. It's great to be back. Yes, today we're going to be speaking, obviously, uh, about Herman Bovink and Reformed Theology and everything that Bovink is. Uh, James is at the forefront of Bovinkian scholarship and uh, doing a lot of work there, not only himself, uh, but also overseeing many uh, graduate students who go on to uh, professorships in other institutions. So we're seeing it in many ways, I don't know if it's a renaissance in, in, the, in the sense that we lost something and regained it, but there's definitely very good uh, uh, you know, advances, and uh, it's a good time to be studying Herman Bovink, and uh, what a wonderful figure to study. But today we're going to be speaking about a new biography, not just any type of biography, but a critical biography of Bovink here, published by Baker Academic, written by our guest today, Dr. James Eglinton. This is a phenomenal book. It truly is. James, I am so thoroughly impressed. I, I, I'm not going to say that I'm surprised uh, because of the nature of your of your work and your scholarship, uh, but I am thoroughly impressed. And wow, right, right here on the back, they've done a good job. And this isn't just marketing and and fake. <laughs> but here's the quote on the back: impeccably researched and thoroughly readable. I could not disagree with anything there from Kristen uh, Dede Johnson at Western Theological Seminary. That's her assessment, and uh, I concur. So this is very exciting to speak about uh, the life of Herman Bovink, um, but to do so in a, in a compelling way rather than you know dry facts and dates and all that sort of thing. But we're going to get into the life of Bovink and get behind uh, the books to understand more of the man, which in turn, obviously, we hope will help us to understand uh, the rich theology there and in service of the church. So I guess I'll start right off and, and James ask you kind of a, an introductory pro forma question uh, just to speak about the subtitle of the book. It is noted as a critical biography and other yeah. biographies of Bob Inc. exist. There have been several in, in the Dutch language, some that were written uh, early on closer to the time of Bob Inc.'s life and there have been recent editions even in English. How is this particular work distinguished from others and what makes it a critical biography? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, So if you think about biographical writing, there are two main approaches you could take. One would be what we could call a commemorative biography. And there have been some of those in Dutch about Bavink. And over the decades after he died, um, every so often a new, really short commemorative biography would appear, uh, which is there just to tell the world this is a great figure. Um, It's kind of an exercise in reputation management as well. Um, So a commemorative biographer um, has a really good idea of the story they want to tell about their figure before they begin the research or the writing. Um, they're not so much interested in things that might not portray their, their figure in a flattering light. Um, so those kinds of things tend to get airbrushed out. So if you go back a while, it would be what we imagine to be hagiography, right? The lives of saints for devotional benefit. Um, another approach would be a critical biography, which is a different kind of biographical writing where you're really committed to the sources. Um, if you if you go back to this person's letters and diaries and their unpublished writings, the whole story of their life, um, for good and bad, warts and all, um, what kind of critical scholarship can you use to talk about, um, about their life um, in, a, in a more rounded way, I guess? Um, in a way where, as the writer, you don't know what the conclusions will be before you start writing. Um, you could be really surprised by what you find, for example, but you're committed to telling the whole story that the sources will allow you to tell. So in my case, that meant um, 
years and years really working with uh, with his diaries with um, with his letters with um, unpublished manuscripts um, with um, newspaper entries that cover his life um, so with all of that kind of stuff trying to tell a story about Bavink that's it's not critical in the sense of you know being an axe a kind of a hatchet job just trying to yeah. tear him to right. bits but it's critical in the approach that I take um, I'm trying to tell the story and I, and I guess in a, a warts and all fashion rather than rather than this just being like reputation management to tell the world or to tell people who think Bavink is great. Yes, indeed, he is great. Um, so it's a different kind of exercise. I think it's more interesting theologically, um, if, you know, if we're committed to the idea that, that people are sinners and um, that we live in a world that's a really complex place, uh, a one-sided story where we only highlight um, you know, the, the obvious easy, the low-hanging fruit is, for me anyways, as a Christian and as a biographer, less interesting actually. Yeah, that, I I could tell right away, not just reading the introduction and your your discussion on the sources, but even just as you read, uh, I don't know how to put this, but you, you I just read the book and I realize, oh, this is a serious work. And I'm using that in a very kind of hefty way. Like this is a serious scholar who has done serious scholarship. And I just get the sense, there's a gravitas to it, not just because it's thick <laughs> but i mean it, it's 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 weighty even even in the even in the material so i appreciate that but then the, you would expect if something is like that then it would not be necessarily readable but i found it to be very approachable uh and so it doesn't sacrifice on either end i'm curious if you could describe open up the the door for us a little bit to know more of the practice of dutch folk at the time uh, because uh, Jan Bavink wrote a, wrote an autobiography for his own purposes as Herman's father, but then, uh, you know, Herman obviously wrote these diaries. I believe I never took Dutch. I I know German, so my German uh, pronunciation might influence my Dutch and then make me make errors. Like I know it's off skiding, even though all every fiber of my being wants to say off shiding. But um, you know, speak about the the dog book or the the practice of that. Is that yeah. unique to Bavink or is that something that that most people did as a daily practice no that's something that was that was um widespread in his era so something that I try and draw out in the book is that Bavink is a modern person born into a, a modern family uh, so his father as you mentioned Jan Bavink um wrote he calls it a short sketch of my life but it was like forty two thousand words long <laughs> and, and he wrote it as an old man not too yeah. long before he died um in a really modern way so um People in that period developed a very keen sense of the, their individuality, of their experiences as unique, and of time is passing so rapidly and the world around you is changing all the time you know, because you've got all kinds of big social changes around you. You have industrial changes, technology, uh, everything is, is just hurtling forward. And you're very aware that your experience of that is unique. Um, and you don't want those unique memories and experiences to be forgotten. So if you're a, a modern person like Jan Bavink, Bavink's father, um, you write down those experiences and, and he wrote this huge, not in any way short sketch of his life, um, which is a very modern practice. And um, and Herman did something similar. So he never wrote, as far as I'm aware anyway, a long, um, you know, a personal autobiography at the end of his life like his father did. But he chronicled his own life um, from his teenage years until the very end in, in Dachbuchen, as you say, in these, a, a day book, literally a journal, um, where he's just constantly writing down his experiences, um, his thoughts. Uh, there are lots of written prayers in there as well. And um, they're part of this awareness of, of the individual, of, of the modern person as, you know, that you are a particular person, that you're not just a, a kind of generic um, human being whose own experiences don't matter that much. So yeah. I think it's really modern in that regard as well and, and wants to try and reflect on his experiences. Uh, something interesting that I that I came across in doing this work is that for a period of his life as a student, he was keeping two journals, two Dachbuchen, and writing sometimes different accounts of the same oh. day's experience, which was really fun to find. Um, and I think my well, my theory on why he did that is that one of them is actually a tiny, tiny book. Uh, when you hold it physically, it's really small, and you can keep it in your pocket. And then the other is, is a more expensive book to buy. It's much larger, so you have more space and you can't carry it with you. So I think that he would quickly write his, his thoughts on experiences as they happened. So he would do this a lot as a student. And then at the end of the day, when he's thought more about them, um, you then get a longer, you know, carefully crafted um, entry on that day and on his thoughts and things. And sometimes what he writes actually differs in his, 
interpretation of his experiences. Um, but it is really fascinating. Uh, it's also part of childhood Christian devotional culture um, in that historical period as well. So parents um, would encourage their children to keep a daily journal like this, where you record um, your, I guess, your self-awareness. Uh, what kind of a person am I becoming in my teenage years? Um, what am I praying for, for example? So it's an aspect of, of personal discipline, uh, of character formation, and it's part of the wider culture, and, and Herman Bavink is very much a part of that. Um, so for them, it's really important to, to chronicle your life, your own and, life. And you even identify in some places which really shed light on his, on his experiences and his perceptions that, that there is even record, whether they're in the doc book or not, um, you have records of purchases he's made uh, at times. Yeah, indeed. So, uh, and his, so he has this bundle of, of, um, of uh, student era booklets, and some of them are journals, but there's also a receipts book. Um, so you, know, you, you have to be well in control of your finances as a student at a, receiving a pretty privileged education. Um, so you know, and you, you don't have like a credit-based economy or anything like that. So you have to measure what's going in and what's going out in terms of your money each month. So we actually do have pretty detailed accounts of um, which books he bought, um, you know, how much money he was spending on cigar and beer, uh, cigars and beer, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we have those actually all throughout right. his student years, which is really interesting. Um, the high school that he went to, um, well, he, he had accountancy classes there. So it's just part of this culture of being um, a good steward of your resources. And, um, and that comes through when he goes to university through him keeping you know, detailed financial records of, of what he was buying. Sure. That makes total sense. You know, obviously, there, there, there's so much material here and detail that, that my goal here is to whet people's appetite so that they go pick up the book themselves and, and read it perhaps multiple times and then read Bavink's theology per se. So, uh, you know, I'd love to have a 24 hour conversation just on all the details and minutia of Bavink. I realize I can't do that and I wouldn't be a good steward and a host in doing that. But big picture, you know, Bavink was raised in a, in a challenging and transitional time period. You, you already mentioned about all the shifts going on in society. And, and that's not just, you know, relative to, to them, but I mean, in world history, this is a pretty enormous transitional time. But how is it evident uh, that Herman, along with his father and his brother, I suppose, really wrestled with the questions of the time, but particularly as they might have applied to Orthodox Reformed participation in modern society. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for the Bavink family, these questions about what place do you have if you're an Orthodox Calvinist in, in modern society? I mean, those were the questions that animated their lives. And the questions that Bavink's father wrestled with and that Bavink and his brothers wrestled with as well. Um, I think you know, the, there's a stereotype of the Netherlands that the people in the English speaking world have today that um, you know, it's, the, it's the most liberal of liberal democratic countries in the world. Mm. And, um, and, it, and people just assume that it's always been like that. But you don't have to go back very far into Dutch history to find that it's pre-democratic phase. So, um, so Jan Bavink, uh, Herman's father, was originally from Germany and then migrated uh, into the Netherlands in search of religious freedom, actually. But um, in his youth um, in the Netherlands, you don't have democracy. You have an, uh, an authoritarian monarch who tries really hard to exercise control over, over religion and, um, and who wants to influence the Dutch Reformed Church to be um, you know, theologically liberal, to be really moralistic, to be a moralizing force to produce um, you know, well-behaved, responsible citizens who are, who are rational and who are anti-supernatural and, and all that kind of stuff. So in that context, if you are reformed at that period, um, you don't have the freedom to be reformed and not be in the Dutch Reformed Church. So there are government offices that fund um, minister stipends. There are government, there's a government office that, that um, tries to tell you what you're going to sing in church on Sundays with the actual hymns that they produce for you, which tend to be quite moralistic, patriotic, mm. and so on. Um, so there was a movement, the Afscheiding, which you already mentioned. So a secession in 1834, when um, a group of, well, originally one pastor, and then the movement grew and grew, and they left the Dutch Reformed Church, and then they formed the Secession Church, eventually became the Christian Reformed Church. So um, Jan Bavink was watching this happening from the other side of the border in Germany, and there was a, a really similar secession movement in his part of Germany as well. So he, uh, he was 
he was converted in that kind of a context, joined the German equivalent of the Dutch Secession Church, and then trained for the ministry in the Netherlands, and then pastored in Germany and moved back to the Netherlands. But while he was doing this, um, this there still wasn't democracy. That didn't happen until 1848, after you know Jan Bavink has, has been a pastor for, well, he's training for, he was training to be a pastor at that point. And um, to be part of a, a contraband church was really dangerous. Uh, your church services could be interrupted by the police happened a lot the pastor would be taken away beaten up fined imprisoned and then the fines go up each time the pastor is caught preaching outside of the, the approved church so if you grew up in that kind of a context um it's a really it's, that's not an easy place to to exist um as a reformed christian when your understanding of being reformed um means that you are a pariah in society, that you have no real prospects for social advancement for your children, um, when you're at risk of imprisonment all the time. Um, so that's a, trying to work out what's your place as a reformed Christian who just doesn't fit into the approved form of being reformed is really difficult. That all changed in 1848 when you have a some when you have a year of revolutions all across Europe and it's the end of the period of strongman monarchs and then you get liberal democracy springing up all across Europe. And that happened in the Netherlands as well. Happened a bit more slowly in Germany, where Jan Bavink was from. But all of a sudden, these seceders who'd been persecuted and imprisoned, um, all of a sudden overnight they're free and they can um, worship as they wish. And the state stops privileging any one church. Instead, everyone's told, um, you know, this is a level playing field. We're not going to approve any of you. Just um, this is a new social experiment where you have to work out what the space you have is in society now that you're not being persecuted. Um, so for the, the Dutch seceders, uh, the big challenge there is that until then, they've been campaigning to have, um, uh, well, some of them were campaigning just to have freedom of religion, and they aspire to an American way of thinking about that, um, and a separation of church and state. But for a lot of them, they were campaigning to have the king recognize them as the true Dutch Reformed Church because the, the, the church that they left um, had wandered so far from its, its heritage. So these seceders all of a sudden who are free have to work out, well, you know, this is a new society and, and none of us have, has experienced pluralistic liberal democracy before. Um, what does this mean for our children? Can we send them to university now? Um, do we want to do that? Um, will they lose the faith if, if, we, if we give them those kinds of social ambitions? So the seceders have, you know, post-1848, in this new age of, of freedom and equality, have all these questions to think through. And the Baving family are so interesting because they were extremely ambitious for their children. Um, and they, they wanted to be, let's say, separate in terms of church identity, but they wanted to be integrated in society. Um, and they thought that Christians had a duty to, to do that. Um, so, the, so they chose really ambitious educational tracks for their children, sent them their sons to, um, to the top state universities. Um, the three sons who survived into adulthood, or the one of them died as a young adult, um, went to study at state universities in law, theology, and medicine. And those are the, you know, the most socially ambitious um, yeah. careers that you could try and follow at that point. So the Bavings are so interesting because they wrestle with all of these questions. And the parents hadn't grown up with liberal democracy or freedom or anything like that. Um, the kids are, are natives in that kind of terrain. But um, you know, the, the, so you have parents and children together who are trying to think through what is our place in our society? How much freedom do we really have? And what's the, you know, how do you follow Christ in this, in this brand new society and this social mm -hmm. experiment? What's interesting as you recount uh, Bovink's educational path, and uh, you know we can we can walk through that uh, you know in broad strokes, but it, it is interesting to see the way he goes, and he has this privileged education in large measure, and he's trying to wrestle with what it means to be an, an Orthodox conservative Calvinist, even in the midst of uh, modernist and, and and you know in the in the colloquial way the liberalized uh, views, even though they tolerated him. Now, some scholars early on, some Bovink scholars and bio previous biographers at least seem to have questioned uh, Bovink's intellectual abilities, at least early in life, and his academic performance. But is that really sustained by the historical evidence? What did you uncover as you were reading through his journals and, and other sources? Mm -hmm. No, it's not sustained at all uh, in terms of concrete sources that are very reliable. Um, so this all comes from Bavink's first Dutch biographer, um, Valentine Hepp, who wrote quite a long, um, very entertaining biography very quickly after, as Bavink was dying and, and shortly after when he had died. Um, 
and uh, so Hep was very happy to use um, entertaining, charming uh, folk histories, um, things that you heard by word of mouth about Bavink. And um, one of the stories that Hep includes about the young Bavink is um, that, uh, so his father was a pastor, as we said, he moved to a town to be the pastor there that had a, a really good um, and quite kind of distinct and modern Christian boarding school that had a very modern curriculum. And in Hep's story, then, Bavink's father thought that, that Herman's older brother was uh, was really smart and had a lot of academic potential and should go to this school, but he didn't think Herman was smart. And um, the teacher from the school says, oh, but let me try Herman out as well and um, right. we'll see how he gets on. And then the, the teacher discovers, wow, there's, he's a diamond in the rough. He's an uncut diamond and we need to smooth him. But uh, so I think where this comes from originally is um, is a romantic search for you know, when a genius is first discovered and it's part of the romantic conception of the one of the great men of history that you have to have that in your story as a rite of passage when someone first spots a genius who could have easily been missed but the big problem with Hep's story is that at that point Herman didn't have an older brother uh, so he had a sister but um, um, but no older brother and um, the story just doesn't check out. Uh, Hep himself says, I was told this by a person in a position to know it. Um, and it's and it's a kind of story that you've heard on the basis of what someone said in, um, in uh, you know, the 1880s. And, and that's a recollection of a private conversation between Herman Bavink's father and a teacher in, you know, the, the 1860s. And um, it, it just doesn't work, um, but it's, you can see the way that it gets kind of edited and chopped and changed a bit throughout the history of people thinking about Bavink's life. Um, so, you know, there's a Dutch biography that came out in the 60s where it's a really good biography in many, many regards. But this story is still there just without the big brother in the story. Um, yeah. And then in Gleason's biography, um, which is the more recent English one, the section on his childhood is called A Diamond in the Rough. Yeah, it's titled uh, after the myth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. so that, that's, I think that it's, it reveals a lot about um, how, you know, there was a kind of romantic folklore and how you construct a story of, of, a, of a genius that they have to have been discovered at some point. Um, but actually, I think um, in Dutch culture at that point, and in history, um, people didn't have a very strongly um, developed sense of childhood behaviours as, as um, you know, something that, that you spend a lot of time thinking about in the way that, that we do now and in the way that later romantics did. But, you know, when Jan Bavink was around, um, I, I, just, I don't think that that really existed in Dutch culture. I think it's a, a later way of looking back and telling stories about people in the past. Mm -hmm. Again, the value of a critical biography. Not saying the yeah, other people aren't yeah. working with any sources or of the sort, but that's that's the value here with this particular volume that, that you, yeah. James, have done the, done the work and really looked at things afresh. And it shows. Jim. Hey, James. Um, so I'm fascinated by the work that you've done um, on the two, the so-called two Bavinks. And we're sort of now backtracking to the introduction or the uh, initial uh, part of your book. But I think it's important uh, for our listeners to maybe get a little glimpse of that debate and your contribution to it. Uh, especially as we get into Bavink's education and then his intellectual development. Um, anyway, would you just be willing to take a couple of minutes to explain to us sort of that whole two Bavink debate and sort of your contribution to how we might best understand Bavink as a historical figure? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Bavink's life is characterized by two things, I think. Um, one is his conservative Calvinist orthodoxy. Um, and the other is his active participation in modern society. So for him to be a Calvinist does not mean that you don't read, you know, the latest developments in psychology or science or anything like that. Um, and that, you know, you live in your mind as though it's still the 17th century. So he's a Calvinist who's very much a man of his own day um, with all the latest developments of things in, in his period. So, and, uh, I guess to a lot of readers um, over the past hundred years, that has seemed to be quite an odd combination. Um, how can you be an orthodox and modern? Because a lot of right. people assume those two things exist in, in tension. Mm -hmm. um, so that gave rise over the course of the 20th century to people reading Bavink 
and saying, but how can he want to be these two things? And this seems to be um, almost like there are two people writing here. Um, and then that's the way that it developed in the ways that people would speak about him and write about him, that there was an orthodox Bavink and a modern Bavink. And the, and the, the puzzle of Bavink's life was that he could never choose which of those two he wanted to be. So people would talk about him as a Jekyll and Hyde um, figure within the reform tradition. So you get lots of talk about this, about two poles in Bavink's thought, about there being two Bavinks. And um, the way that that started to develop in, in um, literature on Bavink was that uh, it was almost like redaction criticism in, the way, in higher critical studies of the Bible, uh, where you know, you're trying to find which author really wrote this section of Isaiah, but there was no one Isaiah, or you know, the same with Genesis or something like that. So you would find people who would write about, you know, this section is the modern Bavink. You move on a few pages and it's the orthodox Bavink, and then he moves back, and um, which is a really fruitless way, I think, to try and read him. And, and it relies on a lot of just assumptions about Bavink that I don't think uh, work. Um, so my first book, it was called Trinity and Organism. And um, it was, so there I really pushed back quite hard against what I call the two Bavinks hypothesis. And I think that theologically, Bavinck's understanding of Calvinism um, meant that to be orthodox doesn't preclude participation in modernity, but also modernity itself is a thing that can accommodate orthodoxy. And I think that's what Bavinck was trying to do. Um, he thought that orthodoxy is something that expresses itself and can express itself in any period in culture or history. And that's part of Christianity being a Catholic faith. It's not a faith that only works in the 16th century or in the Netherlands or in America. Um, so I pushed back quite hard against that and said that we're wrong to talk about two Bavinks. We should only speak about one Bavink. And you can actually see this in his theology with how it works, um, that diverse things hold together in the, in the ways that Bavink thinks, even things like orthodoxy and modernity. So I pushed back really hard against that in my first book. Um, but the first book was about Bavink's theology and not really Bavink as a theologian. Um, but I think in, in saying there weren't two Bavinks, there was only one, um, there's, a, there's a kind of a biographical impulse that was uh, resounding in the first book, even though it's not a biography, um, that then led to me to uh, think that I need to, <laughs> need to write a Bavink biography that shows, you know, there was only one Bavink and what does it look like then when we don't look at his life assuming that everything was divided? Um, actually, I think he had a really capacious sense of the Catholicity of the Christian faith as a faith for all of life and a faith for every culture and a faith uh, for every historical period, including the new one that he was born into. Um, so I think the, the product of that then is, is the, the, the account of his life that I've tried to provide in the biography. Sure. Yeah. And in, in many ways, that leads to some surprising things, at least uh, would have been surprising, I imagine, for his contemporaries. But then to us, maybe surprising who who don't understand, um, you know, the, that that contemporary culture. I wanted to ask you about that as we look at the unfolding of Bavink's uh, development, his his uh, movement from the gymnasium, uh, eventually on to to comp, and you think of um, Leiden, his time there. But how was how was Bavink's educational path surprising uh, when it's compared to his contemporaries, such as a figure like uh, Kalf? Yeah. So. Um... So Bavink's educational path was that he went to a boarding school, um, but in the town where his, his um, where his parents lived and where his dad was a pastor, um, but it was a, a very modern um, kind of school. It was run. It was a Christian school explicitly, um, but you know you would learn. I mean, he learned English, German, French, um, Dutch, obviously, um, music, you know, accounting, all these different things. In what was in its own time a, 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 just a, a very um, dynamic educational environment. So he was really privileged to go to a school like that. Um, I've never found anything by Jan Bavink that says, I took up this call to go to the, the congregation there because of the school, but his dad was so ambitious for him. So it wouldn't surprise me if the fact that the school was there and this kids could go there if he moved to this, this congregation, wouldn't surprise me if that was a factor in his decision. Um, so he went to a school like that. After that, he went to a, a gymnasium, um, which is, um, and you still have them in the Netherlands and in Germany and um, in lots of northern continental Europe. So it's a classical high school that prepares you for university education. Um, so, you know, you lots of your lessons are taught in Latin, um, you do lots of Greek, um, you do lots of uh, classics. So the school that he went to was a, was a really prestigious one. Uh, the prime minister at that time in the Netherlands had gone to that school um, 
Pope Adrian, the, the only Catholic Pope, um, the, the, so the only the only Dutch Pope, I should say. Yeah, um, I've gone to that school. Well, there's a Freudian slip there. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. So, so Pope Adrian, uh, the, the only Dutch Pope, had gone to the school as well. So it's um, it's a really prestigious place, um, and you know if you think about the the social context of the time. Um, Literacy rates were rising in the Netherlands, but most Dutch children, um, if they received an education, also worked in farms and factories at the same time. And um, so to be in full time education, not to have to work in a farm or work in a factory, you know, because this is industrialization is happening, you're, you're in a really privileged position. Um, and, um, you know, this is a, a period where Latin is increasingly seen as irrelevant by the, the new middle class that's been created by industrialization. Um, so the people who still choose to have their kids educated in Latin, like the Bavinks, um, usually have very, very high social aspirations. You know, so you send your child to a school like this because you want them to go to a, one of the universities. Um, and in the Netherlands, at that point, you know, you have a population of you know three million or so, um, and you have fewer than um, two thousand university students in the whole country. You know, wow. So almost no one goes to university at that yeah. point. It's really different to what we have today, where it's a uh, you have a much larger middle class and it's kind of a normal aspiration that you know lots and lots of young people go to university so if you're in that tiny sliver of society that ends up in a, in a classical school like this before university the kind of people that you interact with as a teenager are going to be you know the politicians the university professors um you know the, the movers and shakers at that upper level of society so um so one of Baving's rivals in his um classical high school was a guy called Gerrit Kalf who ended up being the professor of, of Dutch at, at Leiden which is the most prestigious university in the Netherlands at that point and um and Baving beats him to the Dutch prize when they are in school <laughs> together and it's in one of his, his journals that he writes I made one grammatical error Kalf made three and, and Baving wins the prize but he won the prizes for for lots of his subjects at the end of his time there so at that point he's very much on track you know he can go to any university that he wants and um but the weird thing is that he doesn't do that immediately instead he goes to this you know small unglamorous unaccredited theological seminary that, that belongs to his own denomination uh, and then you know his, his friends from from gymnasium don't do that they follow the path that's exactly what you'd expect so his, his educational career uh, takes some twists and turns has some surprises you know, here at Reform Forum, Gerhardus Voss is, of course, a figure that that we look to as as one who has uh, taught us significantly in the area of Reform biblical theology, uh, but also in the area of systematic theology as well. Um, so you talk a little bit about the relationship between Bavink and Voss, or or the Bavinks and the Vosses. Um, would you be able to unpack for us a little bit about the dynamic of that relationship? How did Bavink and and Voss um, have stuff in common and how did they differ yeah they had a huge amount in common so if you think of the kind of um upwardly mobile middle class family like the bavinks who are so ambitious for their children uh, the voss family was was the same uh, so gerhardus went to a, a similar kind of school that was a, a french language school um, um for his secondary schooling for his high schooling um and um, so they're really similar. They, they also have an intertwined family history as well. So the Baving family came from Bentheim in Germany, on the other side of the border, from the, this denomination that's, that seceded from the, the German Reformed Church there. The Voss family uh, came from the same, the same really local area, um, had roots in the same denomination, also ended up in the Netherlands. Um, so they have so much in common, um, and they're both examples of this um, kind of social climb that you see amongst the the more um, you know socially engaged seceders who who really have high hopes for what their children will achieve and who want their children to get lots of opportunities that, that they maybe didn't have you know, before democracy came in. So they have lots and lots in common. Um, uh, I mean, um, I guess the most obvious difference between the two families. Um, was that from early on, the Bavink family were against emigration. Um, so emigration to the New World, whereas the Voss family were, uh, well, they emigrated, uh, as you'll know. And that's how Voss ends up in, in Michigan and then in Princeton. Um, so the, if you think back to the time when the, 
you know, the seceders were persecuted and also in, in, in Germany where the Bavinks and the Russes were from, where they were persecuted. You have lots and lots of emigration, both from Bentheim in Germany and from the Netherlands to, uh, you know, to Michigan, to, um, to Canada as well. And, Iowa, um, yeah. Yeah, so you have all of that kind of emigration mm -hmm. and the, some of the big questions that seceders faced before there was democracy and before there was freedom of religion, they were questions around, you know, if, if, if you face persecution in your culture in this kind of a way, um, does the reformed faith obligate you to stay? Or are you free to up sticks, sail across the Atlantic and, um, and move over there? And what does that mean for the, the, the society that you leave behind? Do you abandon it to unbelief? Are you, um, you know, are you deciding, well, I'm not going to cast my, my pearls before swine anymore? So those are really practical um, and, you know, really rocked theological questions for them that affect, well, your entire life and the country that your children will grow up in, um, you know, your social prospects, all of that kind of stuff. So the Bavings from really early on are anti-immigration. Jan Bavink was anti-immigration. Uh, Herman said really harsh things about Christians who emigrated from <laughs> Netherlands to America. Um, you know, the, for him, this was like the worst thing that you could imagine. Um, to uh, and it was far worse than just being a you know a bit pietistic in the Netherlands and staying there, but ignoring the world around you. If you're if you're not even there doing that, um, the worst thing that you can do is abandon the whole thing to unbelief and move to America. Um, and the Voss family obviously were different. Um, so they, they did emigrate and, um, you know, their lives, Herman's life and Gerhardus Voss' life take, you know, different um, or different directions in some ways. But I think the degree of similarity that they have and the, the closeness that they have in terms of temperaments and, um, you know, they really understood each other theologically. They also have all kinds of similar existential questions about where I belong. Uh, you know, for Voss, that's as a, an, that is as an immigrant um, in America who then Kind of becomes American, and um, but also you know he's very much Dutch as well. Um, you know how you fit in there, and as a Dutch reformed immigrant to America, um, you know, where should he feel most at home? Is it in the Dutch immigrant community? Um, how does he relate to Presbyterianism, which is you know so close, but is also a different branch of the confessionally reformed tradition? Um, you know, should he stay and teach in Grand Rapids? Should he move to Princeton? Where is his institutional home? Um, and around the same time that, that that Voss has all of those questions, Bavink is also asking similar kinds of questions about where does he belong mm -hmm. in the Netherlands? Um, should he stay in Kampen where he was teaching? Um, should he move to the Free University of Amsterdam? Uh, so they have all of these questions in the same phases of life. Um, they're both single for a good chunk of their early lives and were very bookish as a response to that. Um, so it's not a surprise that they understood each other very well. They had a really close relationship. It's not merely just uh, the families and then, you know, they spent time with each other just because they had to. Uh, they seem to, to be very close. In fact, uh, one one gentleman, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he thought he was, was Bavink's soulmate, but yeah. uh, actually Voss was. <laughs> yeah, so um, Bavink had another friend whose, whose dad was his pastor, actually, when he was in, uh, in the gymnasium as a student, and his dad was his pastor. Guy called Nicholas Dosker, who then moved to Grand Rapids to be a pastor there. And um, so Bavink and this guy, Henry Dosker, were really good friends as teenagers, you know, and they were both really, really young at that point. Um, and then Voss emigrates with his father, and uh, not Voss, sorry, Dosker emigrates with his father, um, comes back to the Netherlands occasionally, but he spends the rest of his life in America. Um, and they keep up their correspondence over the years. Um, but this guy, Dosker and Bavink, were. Uh, just on different levels intellectually um you know dosker was he was no slouch but you know bavink was just a in a different kind of category as was Voss. um but dosker did and he didn't really understand all the kind of changes that happened in bavink's thought especially when he became so influenced by abraham kuyper um and all you know, the seceder church changed a lot after dosker had moved to america so a lot of his questions to bavink are questions of clarification um, you know, what's going on there? What's this, um, what are these new ways that you have of thinking? And he didn't really understand him. Um, but Dosker then mediates Bavink a lot to the English speaking world and very much sees himself as Bavink's soulmate, as though they live kind of um, the same life on either side of the Atlantic, which I, um, I don't think that was a kind of mutual feeling from, from Bavink. Right. Um, Poor Dosker. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we all have that friend who thinks that you're like this. You're the like, best oh, friend. Or right. not as close as you imagine. Um, so, yeah, so uh, Voss is a much more accurate um, American interpreter of Bavink than, than Dosker was. You mentioned uh, Bavink's singleness and then led him to, you know, 
have some extra time and bookishness early on in his life, but it's not as if he had no interest. Uh, I'd love for you to speak a bit about his relationship with Amelia earning uh, um, early on and, and also the cultural forces and societal forces involved because, you know, if, if those weren't in existence, he would have most likely been married to her. Yeah, indeed. So from his teenage years, um, in fact, some of the earliest journal entries that he writes as a teenager are about this this young woman, Amelia Dindecker. Uh, he was really enamored with her um, from his teenage years until he was 31. Um, and she was older than him as well, a few years older. Um, but he never married her. Um, and um, But she he never held, married, on, right? held on in hope until he was 31 that this would happen, yeah. but it didn't. Um, and the, the main reason that didn't happen was that Amelia's father would never give permission to Bavinck um, for him to marry her. Um, we don't have any um, you know, sources from Amelia's own hand to tell us, you know, could be that she just didn't want to marry Herman Bavinck, but it looks like um, that probably wasn't the case. Um, so in Dutch culture at that point, if you were you know, a young man who wants to get married, until the age, until until you're about thirty or so, um, you have to ask the prospective father-in-law's permission um, before you can get married. You have three opportunities to do that. So there's actually it's legally stipulated. Um, so you have to play your cards really carefully. A lot of the time there'd be like a sympathetic aunt who you could approach as a as a kind of broker to the deal. Um, and Baving did this with Amelia's aunt as well. Um, but but this guy Ari Dendecker, uh, Amelia's father, wouldn't grant permission, and um, which is, is kind of sad and interesting. But you know, if you if you ask for permission and it's refused, um, you have to think very carefully about how you're going to try and get a yes the next time. So if you if you ask too early and you're rejected by the by the potential father-in-law. Um, you then you know you don't want to rush back in. You want to go away and um, really make your case more compelling the next time. Um, and so, if you're rejected three times in a row, you can then you could then get married without parental permission. But it was socially extremely controversial um, not to have the parents' blessing. It was you know noted there in your marriage certificate and so on. And so you, you don't really want that. Um, you know it wouldn't it, it would be really controversial for someone who was. Um, you know, he played by the rules like like Bavink. Um, so yeah, the tale of, of Amelia is, is a really sad one. You know, he writes about her a lot in his diaries um, in Latin, I think, to try and keep the entry secret. <laughs> uh, but we have we have really epic romantic poetry in there in his diaries. There's a there's a pretty epic marriage proposal poem, and we also have diary entries where he proposes to her, um, and then they like. Um, you know, they go to church together and he writes that, you know, when they went to church together after this proposal, he noticed some problems and he doesn't say what they were. Um, but you can, I guess you can kind of imagine it, that they turn up in church together and sit next to each other in the pew. And, um, you know, he gets some icy stares from yeah, her father and right. that this is not going to happen. Um, so you know, this, I mean, it really does go on from his teenage years until he's 31 before he finally accepts um, this isn't going to happen. But um, it was really, I think, traumatic for him. It's certainly something early on. We get a little window into his mind. And it's a really, I mean, it's a life changing event, really. I don't know who knows how things might have turned out otherwise. But there, there's another kind of early on window into the young Bavink that I thought was was so compelling. And, and it really captured, for me at least, uh, the big, large sweep of society at the time. But you reference Edward uh, Dewey's uh, Decker, whose uh, who's, uh, pen name is uh, Multatuli, <laughs> pardon my pronunciation. Yeah. But alongside, you, you reference him alongside Abraham Kuyper. And in these, in these two prominent voices, you really describe Bavink hearing two competing visions of the future. One is a Christian secularized and or not a post-Christian secularized and atheistic. And the other is a renewal of Dutch culture through a revival of Calvinism. But how did, how did Bavink assess this at the time? I mean, at the time that he was presented with these two visions of the future and would his assessment change later on in life, do you think? Yeah. So this guy, Edward Dowis Decker, um, who wrote, as you say, under the name Multituli, uh, Latin for I have suffered much, um, he was a Dutchman who worked in the Dutch East Indies and um, who went there and was really shocked by the exploitation of the, the locals, of the, of the resources. 
And um, he came back to the Netherlands and tried to be a whistleblower, but people didn't really care. And you know, the Netherlands was becoming a really rich culture because of you know sugar and coffee and so on through the Dutch East Indies. So eventually, he wrote a novel that's um, you know it's a kind of an autobiographical novel, but with a different name called Max Havelaar about a guy who it's basically his story. He goes there, sees what's happening, comes back. So it's an expose in the form of a novel. Um, and this novel, Max Havelaar, came out when Baving was six. So it's part of his childhood and it was explosive. It was the novel, it's been called, that killed colonialism. Um, and it, so it's it's profoundly um, anti-Christian, anti-colonial, anti-Calvinist, all of these things. Um, and it still is, is, a, is a factor, in, it's, a, it's a classic of Dutch literature. So um, if you go into a Dutch supermarket today, uh, the fair trade brand um, that you have on bananas, for example, is called Max Havelaar, named after the mm. novel. So you see it in the supermarket even, mm. um, in terms of the Dutch consciousness towards the effects of colonialism on, on Java. Um, so this book came out when Baving was a child and it had a huge impact. Um, it was just massive. And, and it, and it um, so he's the, the first atheist Dutch literary great. Um, and um, it's a book that then accelerates the de-Christianization and the secularization of Dutch culture. And um, so, uh, you know, this is just part of Bavink's cultural context as he's growing up, that, um, that Multituli is wildly popular with Dutch young people. So Abraham Kuyper, for example, when he was young before his conversion was a big Multituli fan. Um, he gave a copy of Max Havelaar to his, um, his girlfriend's parents to try and win them over to its way of thinking and to civilize them by getting them to read some great new literature. Mm. Um, so this is just there in the background. Um, and then when Baving went to study at Leiden, uh, he went to a debating club where Multituli was the speaker. And um, what Baving was really struck by was, was a confusing experience, because as a Christian, when you hear about the, the exploitation of the locals uh, in the East Indies, and it was truly appalling, uh, you know, Baving's conscience is, is really pricked by this, to think this is awful, and it's, and it's good that this atheist is standing up and denouncing it. Through a sense of justice and righteousness and yet at the same time the novel is also a, a kind of parody and um attack on, on on dutch reformed christianity as complicit in this whole system of oppression and exploitation so you know it's a it's a it's a confusing experience um for for a young person in that kind of a setting um so what do you do with that so he heard multitude in person we know from his receipts book um uh, that he bought a copy of Multituli's work there, and he engages with it quite a lot um, throughout his mature thought and his, and his writing as well, uh, because he's such a huge figure in the Dutch landscape that you can't ignore him. Um, so, you know, Bavink is really ironic and always tries to find the grain of truth, even in the arguments of the person that ultimately he is not on the same side as. Um, you know, so and Bavink's. Um, uh, and one of his most important parliamentary speeches later in life, when he was a member of parliament, um, he praised Multituli for the capacity of his soul to be filled with righteous anger against things that need to be changed in the world. Um, but he says at the same time, I never bowed, I never bowed down at his feet, like half <laughs> of my friends did. So, but what's really interesting in his student years, when he first hears him and enters his company, is that at the debating society around the same time, he also hears this young upstart in the Dutch reformed Calvinist world, um, Abraham Kuyper, and was really captivated by him as well. So Multituli on the one hand is saying, you know, we need to have an atheist future, we need, um, and Christianity is a part of the problem, it needs to go, and we need a secular future. Um, whereas he also hears Kuyper presenting this completely different view of where Dutch culture needs to go, which is that Calvinism answers all the problems of modern life. And it has all the resources it needs to be developed, but I, Abraham Kuyper, I'm developing it and I want other uh, young theologians to join me. Um, so what I think is really significant is that Baving buys Multituli's book and really reads it thoughtfully. Right. But around the same time, he also buys um, a picture of Abraham Kuyper, <laughs> a, a Kuyper poster. And as you can imagine <laughs> that on the wall of his room as a student. Um, and, you know, Kuyper also does what Baving is looking for. He also is really passionate, can be very fiery about things that need to change in the world. Um, so I think it's just it's such a fascinating point of Baving's life to to be able to look in on, as he you know just this privileged education again means that he actually comes right. into direct contact with these people who have, who are trying to shape um, visions of the future. 
Yeah. I'll show me a man's library and I'll, I'll show you the posters on his wall and you tell me which are more effective. Yeah. I think that's quite telling and interesting. And that's again, something that uh, could only be seen through, through the hard work and, and doing the, the critical work of digging through receipts books. It's tremendous. Uh, just to see that window into, into Bovink at the time and it sets him on a path. As you're giving us uh, sort of a, a window into his time at Leiden, uh, I would be interested in learning uh, a little bit, or you talking a little bit more about that experience. Um, you, you know, what was his education like? Who were his most influential uh, professors? Uh, moving from a place like, um, my understanding is moving from a place like Campen to Leiden, um, what would have been unsettling in some ways. Um, tell us a little bit about his experience there in light, in addition to what you've already highlighted yeah. for us. Yeah. Um, so I guess to fill in um, viewers who haven't read the book yet. Um, so he studied as a resident student at his denomination seminary for a year. Um, but he didn't really, like, he, he didn't engage much with the seminary um, while he was there because in that kind of context, in that era, if you went to study theology, first of all, you had to take general humanities classes and then pass a general humanities exam to show, can you read, can you write, um, can you think? Um, so a lot of his peers at the seminary didn't have prior education. So, and for Bavink, who'd gone through such a prestigious um, track as a, in his secondary schooling, in his high schooling, those classes were completely redundant. So just after he arrived, he got permission from the professors not to go to the humanities classes and um because he he didn't really need them and instead he had permission immediately to take the the exam that would then qualify him to study in the theological classes but he didn't take the exam immediately so he was in camping for a year but he doesn't seem to have been very engaged with the seminary um or, or that kind of thrilled to to be there as an academic environment and so after that one year he then moved to the university of leiden which is this you know extremely prestigious ancient university but again, he didn't go straight into theological classes because you have to do your humanities period first. So he spent two years taking classes in mathematics. He did two years of Arabic. Um, he, you know, he did um, logic. I mean, just the, the whole kind of spectrum of of, um, of uh, courses in that period. Um, he didn't enjoy all of them all that much, and he quite often complained that they were a bit boring. Um, he thought some of his lecturers were, his professors were amazing, others less so. Um, but, so in that period, he's not actually engaging with the kind of liberal theology, the heterodox theology that you have in Leiden for the first couple of years. Um, but what he's shocked by initially is more um, the struggles that he had culturally with being a member of, of this orthodox reformed denomination in, in a larger city, um, a kind of culturally secular city, because he'd grown up in smaller conservative um, and you know, uh, more um, culturally Christian towns. And then he goes to Leiden and, you know, the student culture is all about, you know, drinking and swearing and, um, you know, challenging orthodoxies. Um, so he was, uh, um, he was shocked initially by, um, you know, to, again, to work out, how do you um, follow Jesus here? Um, because this isn't an environment that I've been in before. Um, can I become a member of the student society um, or not? And the student society was the kind of thing that, that you know, you join to make social connections and, um, you know, feel like you're really an, an insider of this elite institution. Um, but he didn't join the society, um, which, you know, again, revolved around, um, you know, just drinking far too much alcohol and generally not pursuing a life of, of godliness. Um, but if you didn't join the society, um, which um, maybe an eighth of the students didn't, um, you were known as one of the piglets. So the society members look down on you. So he's he's an outsider there in that regard, um, in Leiden and um, on the periphery of things a bit. Um, and also, you know, he's part of the new middle class um, that hasn't existed for all that long in Dutch culture. And this is an elite university for the sons of the aristocracy. Most students have double barreled surnames or, you know, they're from very privileged backgrounds and they, you know, not all of the students appreciated having these, um, you know, new middle class upstarts like Herman Bavink appearing at their institution. Um, you know, you, you don't have blue blood, um, you know, you, you've got the wrong kind of surname and, you know, you're from this, this weird conservative church. Um, so, Initially, Leiden was more of a cultural shock to him than a theological shock because he wasn't doing theology for the first couple of years. 
Um, his pastor really helped him to adjust to that and led by example in trying to be an integrated Calvinist in that kind of a social setting. Uh, and his pastor also had lots of interactions with the university as well, and that really helped him. Um, when the time came to start taking theological classes in Leiden, he almost backed out and um, almost moved back to camp and to study there, but he carried on um, and was really nervous before he started to take classes with professors who were national celebrities. Uh, I mean, they were they were huge names across the, the whole country and they were you know not famed for their commitment to orthodoxy or anything like that. <laughs> right. um, um, but I think the experience was an odd one for Bavink because what he experienced was was toleration um more so than anything else um the so the the systematics professor that he studied under um was really famed for his his heterodoxy um but by the time that bavink was a student this guy was quite an old man was intellectually extremely predictable you know he hadn't written a major new work for 30 years so you had quite a lot of time to get to know how he thought before he would actually talk to you and you knew exactly what he was going to say so there weren't those you know shocks of um new challenging thoughts so he he wasn't particularly uh, i don't think it was a particularly difficult experience in that regard um i think he made a lot of choices quite pragmatically as well about um who he studied with and, and what he worked on um so when it came to his doctoral dissertation for example um abraham kuyper wanted him to do old testament um, because Abraham Kuyper wanted an Old Testament professor for this new university that he was planning. Um, but I think for Bavink that would have been, well, it would have been its own distinct challenge um, to, to do an Old Testament dissertation if your supervisor was you know, one of the most famous higher critical scholars in, in the world at that point, a guy called um, Abraham Kuhn. And, um, he was also interested in doing a dissertation in church history and his uh, looking at the, the secession uh, of his own denomination. But again, that, how you do that in that kind of a context if you're from that church also was uh, fraught with difficulties or just challenges. Um, he ended up working in ethics uh, for his dissertation, um, working on uh, Zwingli, which I think was quite a safe choice for him, actually, because um, um, he was he was working with with this guy, Johannes Scholten, um, who was his um, who was the systematician, you know, who was really predictable and was a huge name, but um, was you know he only ever engaged with Bavink's doctoral work in terms of typos and grammatical mistakes, but he you know, he was like a spent force by that point, so he wasn't going to try and challenge him too much in terms of doctrine. Um, but um, the person who really influenced them in Leiden was was this Old Testament scholar actually Abraham Kuhnen, who then took over in practice with supervising Bavink's ethics dissertation. Um, and the whole process of that's really interesting because Kuhnen was a really a polymath in theology. He taught ethics as well for a long time in Leiden and was extremely well read also in Zwingli and contemporary scholarship in Zwingli and uh, was also extremely charitable. So he was very far from Bavink theologically, but um, exemplified charity and grace and irenicism towards Bavink. Um, taught Bavink how to present your opponent's viewpoints in their own strongest terms, how to avoid straw men. Um, and also in terms of historical scholarship, um, how to understand a theologian's works as they develop over that person's lifetime. So Bavink learns all of these skills from, from Abraham Kuhnen, interestingly, and his scholarship actually uh, in rigor and in method, although not in, I guess, presuppositions or conclusions, but the, like the mechanics of how you do scholarship very much resembles Abraham Kuhnen, um, but also the personal example of, of being um, charitable and generous and winsome towards people you don't agree with them uh, he learned profound lessons from from Kuhnen. it's interesting to 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 see how this plays out moving on because as Bavink leaves uh, the university and he's, he's definitely accomplished he's certainly capable has invitations to teach at a variety of places I if I'm not mistaken I think he was asked to go to the free university five times <laughs> or thereabouts uh, but yet he ends up uh, in the pastorate and that it really ends up being a, a lonely time for him. Uh, how, do, how are we to, or what are we to make of that? What, what insights do we have in Bavink's life in that period and then moving on into his more traditional academic career? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's quite hard to, to find and to pinpoint exactly um, what Bavink was thinking about the pastorate in his earliest life. So, um, when he was a student in Campen for that year, um, 
the things that he writes about his life then were that he wanted to study theology as an academic discipline rather than pursue a seminary education in theology. And he doesn't write then about wanting to be a pastor, uh, but he keeps the door open um, to move from his Leiden studies to um, being ordained in his church. And he, he does all kinds of strategic things that, that keep him eligible for that. Um, I think when he was enamored with Amelia, um, you can see in his diaries then that he's thinking, you know, together we could be a really good team, uh, a minister and a minister's wife, she's a godly woman, um, we could work together. Um, but then when that doesn't happen, um, again, I don't have, you know, I don't have a diary entry where he, exp where he explains exactly what he's thinking on this, but um, certainly in terms of timelines, it looks like at that point he starts thinking, you know, if this doesn't happen, um, then, um, you know, I could be a, a scholarly theologian. But I guess at that point, you know, he has different options that are open to him. And one of them is to pursue the academic path, to pursue you know, university theology. Um, so he's interested in that point in going to work in Germany. Um, you know, German universities were very exciting in that period in the Netherlands. Um, he's all, he also keeps an eye on what's happening in Edinburgh here in Scotland, um, where I now work um, at New College, uh, which was established originally by the Free Church of Scotland, but the Scottish Secession Church from the same kind of time, first as a school of divinity, but with the ambition that it would that, that would grow and become a Christian university in Edinburgh, so it would be a Free Church university. Um, so he, he, he keeps an eye on what's happening here in Edinburgh as well. And um, so he has these ambitions and his parents seem to approve of this as well, that they're happy for him to, to go and visit German universities and to explore a path there. But none of that happens. And, um, and um, he ends up um, becoming a pastor in his own denomination in a small city in the northwest of the country. Um, and I think initially he looks like quite a reluctant pastor. Um, hmm. He, you know, he he'd become accustomed to how you function in you know elite scholarly society and the kind of conversations that you have and the things you know that you talk about, but uh, and although he passed the, the end exams in Campen that qualified him to to be ordained, he hadn't taken any theological classes there, so he's aware that this denomination is animated by a kind of theology and piety that he grew up in but hasn't been schooled in. Um, so for him to move from you know the University of Leiden and from his doctorate into a church that had all kinds of problems as well um, in terms of previous pastors where things hadn't really worked out well, um, that was a really difficult thing for him and he didn't really relish it initially. So he was quite a reluctant pastor. And you can see from things that he does at the very beginning um, of his time in, in the pastorate that he, he doesn't see this as his end destination, that he wants to end up teaching theology probably in his own denomination, but to do that, he has the pastorate first. Um, he also had a really high view of the pastorate as well and of the ministry. So it's it's not that he kind of looked down on it or anything, um, but you know, he comes from a tradition where you're expected to have a, quite a keen sense of um, experiential assurance that you're doing what God wants you to do. Uh, you know, so his dad used to cast lots to determine the will of God, right. and the decisions to make. And, and Herman himself just has a lot of wrestling with uncertainty about the choices he makes in life in this early phase and are they what God wants. So he's a reluctant pastor initially. And, uh, you know, he, don't, he hadn't preached that many times before he became a pastor. And most of the time it was in the same two texts. And then, you know, to step on the treadmill of a different text every Sunday and, you know, really to throw yourself into the lives of people in a you know, who, who are not part of the, the, the elite sliver of society that you've been in yourself for the last few years of your life. That was all quite difficult. Um, and he was just so lonely as well. Um, he went from the carefree life of a student to, uh, and because he, well, because he was single, living with this older couple who were expected to do all of his, you know, cooking and cleaning and all that kind of stuff, and who treated him in an extremely formal way because he was, you know, Reverend Bavink, and he couldn't be Herman with He's anyone. He's the dominee. Yeah, Dominic, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> he just couldn't switch off with anyone. And um, that was a hard, hard shift to adjust to. Um, and his letters to, to his friends from that time and uh, that year in the pastorate are really, uh, I think they're instructive for, for pastors to read today because of the kind of questions he asks himself about his sincerity in his pastoral work. Um, is, this a, is this just a role that I'm learning to act in? Or, you know, 
in one hour of the day, you know, you're leading a funeral for someone that you might not know that well because you've only just become pastor. Then the next minute you're rejoicing with someone, and then the next minute you're you're leading a prayer meeting, and then you're writing a sermon. And how do you project yourself into all of these situations every day, and 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 be authentic, and really mean what you do? So his, the questions that he asks are are really thoughtful and um, you know worthy of reading to, for your own self examination. I think. Um, but he really grows into the role though and, and starts to love the work that he's doing. And he was only a pastor for just over a year, but he was quite sad to leave it in lots of ways. Um, so, you know, he, at the very beginning, you know, he takes on some academic work alongside this, you know, working for a journal, editing a volume of great theology in the Leiden synopsis. So he's doing all these things that, that give him a bit of momentum to step beyond this. But then when he did step beyond it, uh, he was genuinely sad to leave. I could go any number of places, but I'm interested uh, for us to close with his American experience. Mm. Um, he comes over here to America, um, and of course, you know, he does have that background of being critical of those who who uh, emigrate uh, over here, and uh, so he has an opinions that form about Americans and about America, mm. um, and uh, there is an experience that you uh, record that he has with a certain Southerner. Um, which he brings back and he shares with his people um, in, in the Netherlands. And I think um, uh, instructive in, in so many different ways, but uh, maybe James, you can kind of take us uh, as we're closing out here about his um, experience in America and uh, what, it, what it was like for him and his thoughts and opinions about Americans and, and America in general. Yeah, um, so he went to America twice. Um, first as a, as a younger man, and then secondly, at a later stage in life. So the first time was in 1892. And um, he went there as a, an ambassador of this modern Calvinist movement that he was a part of. Um, so he went to talk to English speaking reform people who needed to know that being reformed should lead you to think about all of life for the glory of God and all of life in an intentionally Christian way, rather than just, you know, reformed as the, the five points of Calvinism and, you know, maybe pedo baptism, if you really take it seriously, uh, but instead it's being reformed as, as this huge life vision in a kind of Kuyperian sense. But in that, in that visit though, he had this, um, this idea of travel as an art and that involves not passing judgment on the foreign. So he's very you know, appreciative of and, and attentive to difference and doesn't want to say whether it's good or bad in that phase of life. But he came back to America in, um, well, later on in, um, in 1908 to give the Stone Lectures at Princeton. And by that point, he had completely given up on the the like the elegant traveler way of thinking and um he was he was publicly polite while in america but um but his own notes are full of critical observations and some of them are you know they're quite entertaining to read today like american teenagers are really rude and dutch teenagers are very polite and um and all that kind of stuff um which is just quite fun to read um nothing changes yeah <laughs> yeah well i think it's probably changed in the netherlands dutch teenagers are pretty rude too um but he also, but one of the things that he pays most attention to is race in, in America. And um, it's the thing that, that he was, I think, truly shocked by. Um, and I guess you have to remember that, that at this point, the Netherlands is an ethnically extremely homogenous country. It's much more diverse now, but, um, you know, so the, the whole experience is, is a really interesting one for Bavink. Um, but what he was really struck by in, in various places was, um, it was just racialized hatred and, um, and even the segregation of Christianity along um, racial lines. Um, so, um, yeah, he, he left all kinds of notes in his, in his diaries, but also there are whole manuscripts where he's written about race in America, where he's tried to read um, uh, literature by African-Americans as well to try and understand what they have to say in, about their experience. Um, and he was really fearful about the future, that, um, that this would lead to uh, increasing violence. Um, and, and he used this again in the Netherlands to tell people don't emigrate. So um, he was he was really fearful that the American experiment, uh, as he saw it, would fail. Um, that the only hope for it was uh, was what he called the path of religion. But by that he means uh, obviously um, the Christian faith, um, which is you know, he says this is for all people. Uh, teaches that the whole human the whole of humanity is of one blood, and needs one savior. Um, but he was really fearful of, of how Christianity as it was developing in America at that point 
wasn't able to meet the needs of its day because um, because Christianity was also divided along um, racial lines as well. So the things that he writes about race are, are really striking. I mean, the, the reference that, that you made there, Jim, to what he was told by a Southerner, and he doesn't say who this is, but a Southerner told him that, that African-Americans aren't human, for example, um, that they are um, half human, half ape. I mean, things like that really, really shocked him. You know, Bavink was also very attentive to you know, the latest developments in biology, um, evolutionary science, and so on. So, you know, the, the kind of stuff that, that he was hearing there uh, was, was, was really shocking to him, but also be just because of his commitments to the organic unity of the whole human race. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that really left him kind of shaken um, quite deeply, I think. Yeah, we see uh, a, a helpful window, even for us Americans, Jim and I, um, to have a, a Calvinist and, and in many ways, uh, really faithful perspective on some of the darker portions of our own history. And uh, those are major pain points, even in this present day, but we need to, to look to Christ and learn about those things. And I think if we read the, the dogmatics and particularly on Bavink on anthropology, and then on Christology, we see the the wonderful glories of, of what God has done for us in his, in his providence and in his grace. Um, I need to just tell you once again, James, thank you uh, for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for writing this book. But of course, we want listeners to um, not only get a copy of this, uh, Bob Inc., A Critical Biography, which is published by Baker Academic, uh, but take a look at Trinity as Organism and also the previous, uh, the new translation and edition of Bob Inc.'s Christian Worldview, which is available from Crossway. So we'll have links to those uh, books in the episode description. But thanks so much for taking the time, especially late on a Friday for you. Uh, it's been a joy and a pleasure. Uh, it's been it's been an honor to have you with us. Thanks, Wes. It's been great to talk with you guys. Thanks for having me. You you bet. Anytime. We'd love to do part two, three, part ten, whatever. You're welcome. <laughs> Open door. We'll, we'll, all day. <laughs> we could, and I'd like to, uh, but uh, you know, um, we don't want to keep you. Uh, of course, you can find out more information online. We'll have all the links available in the episode description to places you, you would like to go. But of course, you can see and find out more about what we're doing at reformedforum.org. You'll find information about all of our other programs and events and uh, publications. And we do want to thank everybody for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.